Expedition to Castle Ravenloft by A. S. Riel Chapter 5 Glory at the Gallows Godfrey Harker's Journal, Ninth of Nightall I have received dire news today. If my death predates my mother's, which looks ever more likely, and this journal should come into her possession along with the rest of my effects, I hope that she tires of this narrative long before this entry. For if I ever make it out of Barovia and speak with my mother, I will concoct a lie or story that will be more palatable to her more delicate sensitivities. I am writing now from the meagre firelight of a roadside camp. We are making ready to venture into the camp of the so-called Vistani folk. Their leader is Madame Eva, the wisdom we are en route to. We are taking a moment of respite after an eventful journey so far, and, as with so often, I am lacking the patience to put events down in their true order. Therefore, I must start again, back at around midday, whereupon meeting with Ashlyn at the Blood of the Vine Tavern, the four of us mounted up and took the road southwest. It felt odd to be leaving Barovia. I realised that I had only been in the village for less than a day, and yet it seemed to me now so all-encompassing. The misty shadowy forms of mountains and trees that loomed beyond the reaches of the village seemed to me like a nightmare that lingered at the edge of my subconscious as I drifted slowly sleepwalking towards them. As we left the outer limits of the village, I felt as though I was taking a very real, physical step toward my nightmares, those that had been haunting me. Almost an hour into our journey, we came to an old crumbling stone bridge that spanned the wide steel-grey waters of the River Ivlis. The waters gurgled and spluttered over moss-covered stones that had long since fallen from the bridge's walls. We all crossed the bridge, each hoping that every hoofbeat would not be the one that sent the remains of the bridge tumbling into the waters and sent us into an icy shock. As it had done since we had arrived in Barovia, mist hung heavy all about us and rain threatened always. The clouds above looked so full and heavy that you would think they would fall from the sky and crush you in a dark and cold embrace, but our luck held and throughout most of the journey we had only occasional patters of rain to contend with. We paused after a short period of riding beyond the bridge to feed the horses and give their legs a break from our weight. My mind had been racing since we had been back out on the road. Long rides are usually the best time to put together thoughts into a coherent whole, yet now my mind remained as clouded as this dire land. Ashlyn, I said, thinking perhaps they would crystallise into something more concrete if I gave my thoughts voice. There is clearly a lot more darkness here than any of us truly realised. You and Mina have been sent here to eradicate the zombies, and yet now we discover the mounting misery that looms like grey clouds over these people. We heard from Ismark that the letter we received that enabled us to even find Barovia was forged, and that the poor Burgomaster is dead. To compound this further, it seems he was not even taken by the infestation, but seems to have fallen prey to the Count. This, I tried to recall the name we'd been told, and as the word took shape in my mind, a cold seemed to envelop me. Count Strad von Zarevich. At that moment a howl erupted from some darkness in the trees that loomed large across the barren fields off to the left side of the road. We all looked in its direction, and I won't lie about the sudden increase in my heart rate. Ignoring the ominousness of this, I carried on to my eventual point. We know nothing of this Strad other than the Burgomaster apparently was already fearful of him, as he was using a raven symbol to ward the Count away, only it failed. Do you know anything of this? When I tell you the look of darkness that clouded Ashlyn's face then, you will appreciate the mounting gloom I felt in my own heart. Yes, I had heard rumours. I've been ignoring them in favour of the rumours of the Sun Sword. One can only stand so much darkness without buckling under it. If I can find the sword, maybe it won't matter that the symbol is not working. What makes me most afraid though is that old Indorovich was using the symbol against the Count. Mina drew a sharp, sudden breath, and Ashlyn nodded. Turning back to myself and Bevik, who were clearly not following Mina's conclusion, Ashlyn continued. The symbol of Ravenkind is an ancient artefact. According to the oldest legends, it was delivered to a paladin here in this very region, long before any church was formed here. Delivered by a giant raven. What makes me more afraid is that it was delivered to this paladin in order to help them root out and destroy vampires. Lugdana, the paladin, wore the symbol for all of their life and was told to have slain many of the Nightwalkers. If the Burgomaster was using this symbol against the Count Strahd, I can draw only one conclusion. 
A nasty silence hung about us as we prepared our horses to continue the day's travel. After a short ride further, we turned north and began to head in the direction of the grave-faced mountains that frowned down upon us. The trail was presently pressed more closely on either side by the dark woods. As we travelled, the occasional sounds of howling or other beastly wails came from us from either side. It sounded as though we walked between a conversation being held over a great length. Mina hailed me as we rode through a particularly tight stretch of the trail where the trees towered above us. Godfrey, she started, and I could hear the unease in her voice. While we've been riding, I have, with Pellor's grace, cast speak with animals. I have listened to the wolves over the last mile or so. They are speaking about us, I believe. They don't speak with the depth of humans, but I have heard them say, to some effect, for, north, and return. I don't know what they mean by return. Is that normal? I asked, having never been one with nature, or had any way with beasts. Maybe. They could just be hunting us, and if so, we'd better keep our wits about us, but something in me tells me it's more. This whole place, it seems connected. Like the trees and the wolves are all a part of one malevolence, it feels like it's watching us. I confided in her the feeling I had had from the watching gaze of the castle and how I had felt the cold oppression of that dark fortress above ever since. Do you think the Count is really a vampire? I don't know, but I have no doubt in my mind that this place is evil in the worst sense. Whatever the Count is, I believe he does not want what's best for the people of Barovia. Bevig and Ashlyn were then informed of Mina's learnings, and the four of us rode on with the prickling fear of being watched. The Raven Tome Stories and Tales of Knights of the Raven in the 1400s DR Sir Uric in Barovia continued Spectres at the Crossroads Barovia, home of death and darkness, hell in the mists, this place has become my unwanted home and I shan't leave it until the mists are lifted and life once more flourishes in this land. I hope future knights of our great order will read this tome and see a turning point here in Barovia. A turning point in our struggle against the undead and the end of the falling numbers of our order. At least on the second count I think I can be assured. Either the order dies with me or our numbers will rise again. I think of the raven every day and pray for the latter. This day I'm given hope. In my daily hunt, I was set upon by three dark figures, mere suggestions of the human form. They loomed out of the trees as if ancient woods themselves were coming to life. They lunged down upon me, bare glimmers of red eyes thrumming from darkness beneath their ethereal cloaks. I stood to confront them, silvered sword in hand, but I could see that I was having no effect upon them. After four or five swipes of my blade, only one seemed to wound the fiends. When their spectral arms reached out and passed through my flesh, pure despair seemed to flood in. It was as though a gash had been opened and everything that this place represents was allowed entry to my soul. The darkness and misery that hangs in every passing mist seeped into my veins and pulsed around me. It was all I could do to turn from these creatures and flee the forest. The wavering shapes pursued me without the fatigue of flesh and muscle that beleaguered me. My plate hung heavy about me and clanged as I put all my energy into the flight. I burst from the trees and looked around me. I had arrived at a crossroads. In my already self-pitying state, the crossroads filled me with gloom. Nestled in two corners of the junction was an old wooden gallows that was creaking in the chill, and a small plot of moss and weed-covered graves encircled in a crumbling stone wall. I was almost ready to make my last stand at this of all places and die amongst the long dead. And then a great blessing was bestowed upon me. I saw a small party approaching the road. Two glowing in the colours of Pelor, and the other one small and the other mighty, were both bristling with weaponry. I called out to beg their aid and then turned to fight. I redoubled the grip on my sword and bared my teeth. Before the foul forms even reached me, a mighty roaring figure and swinging blade raced ahead of me, but much as I had experienced before, the blade seemed to do no harm to the creature. Better prepared this time, I dodged two attacks, but saw my new companion touched by the long tendril-like fingers, and I could see the same hopelessness flood in his eyes before he was able to rip himself clear of the grasp. A burst of golden flames lit the gloomy afternoon then, but the creature flickered like smoke and was unarmed yet. Even with the new arrivals, the outlook was grim. No more so than the sight of two more of the shadowy figures, one looming out from behind the gallows and another emerging from the mist-filled graveyard. One of them latched its deathly grip onto the spellcaster, and the halfling dodged the other. 
In no more than a second had the agile fellow pulled his bow and lodged an arrow between the red glowing eyes. Somehow the arrow hung there, piercing the gloom as if floating in a shadow before the creature dissipated like so much smoke blown in the wind. Watching the death of one I previously thought unkillable was a tonic to the despair that had been pulsing about my veins since the creature had touched me. As one of the other newcomers seemed to cast something on her blade, I surged with this new hope and swung my sword through the spectre, and relished at the screeching that found my ears from unseen mouths. Hurin did his best to harry the creatures, but I could see the poor beast was having little luck, and its black wings passed in and out of the hooded shape's form. It brightened me to see my beautiful raven exemplifying our order in the face of such evil. The battle at the crossroads tested my resolve, and I could see it affected my new companions greatly. Myself and the other big fellows slashed at the spectres with little luck, but managed to stay clear of their evil grasp. Golden fire once more ripped into the hooded shapes, and this time we were rewarded with yet more rasping cries of pain. From the corner of my eye I spotted the halfling grasped, and I watched as his little legs buckled under the sheer misery of it. Pulling himself free, he staggered around and swung aimlessly with his rapier, but did nothing of consequence. The woman with the golden armour and glowing sword raged into battle alongside the spellcaster, and I watched as her blessed weapon tore through the dark forms, as did mine as I continued to fight, spurred on by the turning tide. With blade and flame we battled our nightmares until they began to disappear, as the first had done before them. The battle was ours, I was sure, but then my heart sank. A cry so pitiful it felt as if I had once more myself been touched by the evil. A cry wailed out behind me. I saw the halfling fall to the ground and saw despair in his eyes. He dropped his sword and moaned out as if calling for mercy in this merciless realm. Without a care for his sword, he dashed from the creature, avoiding the grasping tendrils and collapsed into the mist beyond crumbling tombstones. With what seemed like a final tether of sanity, he shot his bow once more and the gleaming tip disappeared into the shadowy form and sent in wispy tendrils to whatever place these foul things go when their life had been drained. Those still on our feet and still with hope in our hearts turned on the final creature, but before we could finish it off, it flowed like black water over the gallows, creaking boards and disappeared into the gloom of the woods beyond. Nights to come, I hope that this battle at the crossroads, the glory at the gallows, will be studied as the turning point, the first victory of many on the road to the eradication of undead in our world. Hey everyone, my name is ASRL. Um, thank you so much for watching if you've made it this far. I um, haven't done this series in a long time. I've been doing other things with work and other, other projects as well, um, but really excited to pick it back up again. Um, I've put a few new kind of production-y bits on it as well, so learning from some of the other videos I've been doing, I really appreciate it if you've listened this far and if you've listened to any of it before. Um, if this is the first time you've watched, I will be going back through and kind of editing some of the stuff from before as well. Um, but either way, really appreciate you listening and watching along. Um, if you like this, do please give it a like and a comment and, and subscribe if you would like to. Uh, and yeah, look forward to seeing you all on the next episode.